value this time in your life, kids. Because this is the time in your life when you still have your choices. And it goes by so fast. When you're a teenager, you think you can do anything, and you do. Your 20s are a blur. 30s, you raise your family, you make a little money, and you think to yourself, what happened to my 20s? 40s, you grow a little pot belly, you grow another chin. The music starts to get too loud. One of your old girlfriends from high school becomes a grandmother. 50s, you have a minor surgery. You'll call it a procedure, but it's a surgery. 60s, you'll have a major surgery. The music is still loud, but it doesn't matter because you can't hear it anyway. The 70s, you and the wife retire to Fort Lauderdale. Start eating dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You have lunch around 10, breakfast the night before. Spend most of your time wandering around malls looking for the ultimate soft yogurt and muttering, how come the kids don't call? How come the kids don't call? The 80s, you'll have a major stroke. You end up babbling to some Jamaican nurse who your wife can't stand, but who you call mama. Any questions? <laughs> Welcome to Bay Area Psychology. Tonight, we focus on men at midlife. Midlife can mean a lot of different things to different people. It certainly meant a lot to Billy Crystal. For tonight's purposes, I will take my definition of midlife from Gail Sheehy's newest release, New Passages. She breaks life development into uh, provisional adult, 18 to 30, first adulthood, 30 to 45, second adulthood, 45 to 85. Our focus for tonight is on the transition from the end of our first adulthood to the beginnings of the second adulthood. She points out that it's often in these years, between 45 and 55, that key questions arise about our lives. This period invokes terms like midlife crisis, or even male menopause. In a recent article in the Mercury News, Peter Gordy shared his struggle with midlife, describing his father's crisis rather stereotypically. A tan, a sports car, starts working out, and found a much younger wife. We are fortunate indeed to have with us Gary Plepp, a licensed clinical social worker, and Pat Purcell, a marriage and family counselor. Both men have been active in the Northern California Men's Center uh, in Campbell, and in fact probably see a lot of men who struggle with this very issue. I want to welcome both of you uh, with us this evening. Thank you. Okay. I chose uh, the brief monologue from City Slickers where Billy Crystal's sort of outlining the progression of life. and. Um, of course, the time we'd be talking about is where he mentioned growing a second chin and music being too loud. And I'm sure that there are times where you do have men who may come into your office concerned about what this transition or time in their life uh, may bring up for them. Sure. Is that accurate? Yes. Actually, uh, a lot of the men I see, that, that is not their focus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think in many ways it's been kind of a public, uh, um, you know, editorialized, over, over sold. Okay, so maybe there's some myths about this time period you might want to you might want to point out for us. Well, I certainly think that there's a truth to it uh, based on some biological principles. We certainly see some changes but that is not the only focus. I mean it's kind of a simplistic way of looking at it I, I think. Okay, how about you? I, I think um, a lot of men are concerned about having meaning in their life and purpose you know and at that age they start looking at their lives and wondering you know am I doing what I really want to do with my life have I had an impact in the world have I lived my dream and uh, okay. those kinds of issues well and part of this why this would be so pointed at this point does have to do with the expanded lifespan that we do have and the fact is that we do have more time and uh, one of the some of the research I was doing some of the authors pointed out that with this extra time, uh, a lot of us may enter a period of uh, enough financial prosperity or enough stabilization in general in our lives where we begin to have time for these kinds of concerns rather than at earlier parts in history where we were still struggling to survive um, at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So you may be having men who actually may have options that they may not have had in the past. See, see that's where I differ because I, a lot of the men that I see in my practice what is caused, they don't have the luxury of stabilization because careers are changing every three years. Uh, there's more awareness about what works and what doesn't work in relationship. Relationships are changing very fast. How long people stay together is a shorter period of time. So there's a lot of things that are precipitating crisis and examining one's life. And it may come in the, in the 20s, it may come in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. Okay. 
And certainly there's a biological dynamic, as I said earlier, but that is not the only factor. Okay. That, may, well, that may be a key one to begin with then, since that seems Absolutely. to be something that sure. comes up. Let's take a look at our first graphic on the role of biology. Is it true, as Gail Sheehy reports in her new book, New Passages, that there is a broad consensus that there's a middle-aged male potency crisis? Is this a real issue uh, for men? Or do you find that, in general, that um, biology means other factors, just like uh, maybe changes in, the, in eating or changes in the need for sleep and that sort of thing? Well, I think there's more emphasis, like uh, I think Pat was alluding to, about you know exercise and and uh, some things that you talked about earlier, you know, what do, how do I maintain my life at this point? What changes do I look at? Um, so again, just to focus on the sexuality is, is, is you know, a portion of, but certainly right. not the greatest portion. Okay. Is that a portion in your practice? Or do men come in concerned about their sexuality in your practice? Sometimes. Um, a lot of people in my practice have been abused as children, and so it's a it's another dynamic that's involved there. Okay. And then some of the men um, deal with anxiety in general in their lives. Again, you know, finding their sense of self, who, who they really are. And um, in that search for their true identity, sometimes that'll affect their sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, um, of taking a look at issues that maybe men have been aware of previously but have not put aside the time to attend to, you know, when you mentioned some maybe earlier issues in their life, childhood, or things that maybe at this point, for whatever reason, are being triggered and coming up now. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is that closer to accurate? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the second issue, which is a little more broad, our point of view. We have developed a much broader consciousness about the quality of our lives, interest in our physical, emotional, psychological and spiritual health. So some of the issues that may be coming up for the men you're working with at this point, maybe some of those areas, do you see spiritual kinds of questions? And Absolutely. Uh, I think men are much more uh, able to look at uh, their spirituality and to question, like Pat said, you know, you know who am I as a man? And uh, look at their role models that they've had from their childhood and to develop something different. The purpose of a lot of my men's groups is to define more clearly who men are as men and because there have there hasn't been good models so now we have the luxury of uh, looking at um, who we are as men what kind of men we want to be what kind of standards we want to have what kind of fathers we want to be and how we you know going on into later life how we want to deal with taking care of our elder parents because some of us who are older are that sandwich generation that also have to, to look at multiple facets of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then in fact those obligations and uh, do begin to shift, I think, depending on at what point in your life you might be. What come, you said men come into your practice uh, talking about maybe putting to rest some old issues. Uh, Patrick, maybe um, also having to do with spiritual issues, uh, relationship issues? Yeah, the spiritual dynamic is real exciting for me. It's, uh, it feels really special to be a witness to their spirituality, you know, to, to have them share what they believe in or what they're searching for and uh, to look into those issues. And it seems to be a real uh, important factor in their whole search for self. And how do, you, how do you help them access that spiritual part of them? I use hypnosis and, and relaxation techniques and ask them to just get quiet and listen inside. And a lot of times when they do that, that'll uncork issues for, or unfinished from their childhood. It'll uh, make them more aware of their feelings. It'll make them just keep tracing deeper and deeper inside themselves. And their spirituality starts to evolve just as their natural sense of self, their best self, starts to evolve after a while. So in your men's groups that you um, have mentioned, is this something that men can help other men do in terms of opening up this conversation? We, you know, there's so many topics that come up in, in group. Uh, spirituality doesn't come up as often as I would like it to. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to share was is taking men from those groups who have an interest in developing their spirituality and taking them out on a vision quest, which is a pilgrimage into the wilderness where they stay and fast for three to four days. And uh, that's an incredibly 
powerful experience because it's something they give to themselves. And when they're sitting out there alone, they can decide who they are as a man. They can decide how they're connected to their spiritual parts. And uh, it's, it's been an incredible experience to see what these men have brought back. And it really is. I, I went on one of the vision quests, and it was great to just stop and take a look at my life and where I'm going and what's been happening. And it was kind of a marker for a transition in my life. And um, I've been a, a, I've accompanied Gary and another one, and it was really remarkable to see these people, these men, before and after their vision quest. They had brighter eyes, more alive, and more uh, just energized. So it sounds like as facilitators, it can be um, in many ways as rewarding as uh, for the participants. I mean, to be involved in an area where there's that kind of energy and that kind of growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's incredible. It really is incredible to see the, the responses from the men. And, um, you know, they, they just bring back so much. Okay. And I think it, it's a great place. We talk about midlife change or crisis. It's a great way for men to go out and evaluate their crisis, uh, if you want to call it a crisis, or just to assess and see where they want to go. Okay. And in the groups, I've had a group for men who were abused as children, and in that group, um, their spirituality did evolve, and most of them were already pretty open about it because they were from Catholic uh, parishes and they had okay. a Catholic background, and they, so they were pretty open about it. Okay. So it wasn't something that was so foreign that you had to find a way to introduce. Right. Okay. We're going to take a quick 30-second break. Uh, stay with us, and when we return, we'll learn more about Men at Midlife. 